Father God, thank you that you are a redeemer. Thank you, Father Lord, that you, God, have done so much for us that give you so little. Father, I do pray today, Lord, that as we read from your word and as we listen uh, through your spirit and by your spirit, God, that, God, we experience you in a real and a powerful way today. Holy Spirit, I pray. God, that you would wear me like a suit of clothes. I pray that you would speak every word through me. I pray that, uh, that you would guide us, that you would open our ears, that you would allow our eyes to see. Uh, Father, and I pray that we get out of the way, that we remove the pride, that we remove the selfishness, that we remove our own desires for ourselves, God, and allow ourselves to clearly hear you today. Lord Jesus, I ask all of this in your name. Amen. Man, if you got your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn with me to the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel, as we look at uh, a couple weeks here prior to uh, revival, uh, the meetings beginning. I'm hoping that, that already through the, the series on the Holy Spirit and through uh, our book that we're studying on Sunday nights called The Calvary Road, I'm, I'm hoping that you're already experiencing revival in your own life. Uh, so often we have looked at years past and we look at revival meetings as a revival. Well, those are just meetings, okay? Those are opportunities that we have to come and to gather together, to spend more time with the Lord, to have someone speak to us or preach to us, to have an opportunity to worship a little different way in order to be able to hear God in order for a revival to happen within our own lives. And so sometimes we get that messed up. We think that, that revival only happens during that time. Well, that's not the case at all. Revival can happen anytime. You can experience revival in your life today, right here in this room. You can allow God to fan the flame that is within you to burn and to rage once again in your life. And so as we walk through the next couple of weeks, I'm going to do a series, a short series called Pathway to Revival. And you say, well, that's kind of similar to the Calvary Road. Well, yes and no, but I'm really not necessarily using stuff out of the Calvary Road. I'm going to use revival passages in the Bible, and we're going to talk about those and in hopes of preparing your heart for a revival to begin within you. And I, I pray that it happens today. I pray that you don't wait until October the 6th. But I do pray that you're here October the 6th and 7th and 8th and 9th to be able to listen and to hear God speak through Brother Barry and through the, our, our worship team that's going to come. And uh, to, in order to have a new light, a new fire built within you. Amen? 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 Amen. Amen. Are you listening? All right, I want you to listen up, okay? I want you to listen up and be with me this morning, okay? If you're in Ezekiel, I want you to turn to the chapter 37, okay? It's chapter 37 in Ezekiel, and some of you already know where I'm going. Some of you don't, okay? But you're going to know. You've heard the passages before, and you, you're going to understand as I read the passages kind of where I'm going with this. But, but we see that this is the, the Ezekiel... Man, Ezekiel's a watchman, okay? He was assigned by God in order to go and to tell the different nations of the wrath that was to come, the restoration that was to follow, and an opportunity for revival to happen, both in today's time and in the millennial kingdom, okay? So it's a, it's a book of prophecy, and, and we see that, that Ezekiel is to the point in which the passages we're looking at is about the nation of Israel and the revival of that nation of Israel in the millennium kingdom and so we're going to look at that and how that applies to my life and your life in experiencing true revival in the church, in our own personal lives. So if you look at me in Ezekiel chapter 37, we're going to read the first three verses. The hand of the Lord was upon me. This is Ezekiel, okay? He is writing. The hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord. And he set me down in the middle of the valley. And it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass among them and round about. And they, behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? This year has been drought conditions for the farmers in a lot of areas. 
Uh, there's a cotton field in front of our house and, and the, the land that we have here in Antioch. And when you drive by that cotton field, you recognize it hadn't had a lot of, it hadn't had a lot of, of water. It hasn't had a lot of moisture, and so it's been through a drought. The cotton is very short. It's not very tall. It's already in full bud, which is not right. There's, there's a lot of things that's going on with that cotton, and it's just not going to be able to produce what it needs to produce. See, see, cotton this day and time is different than cotton was 100 years ago. See, they got machines and chemicals and different things they spray on the cotton. They spray cotton to speed it up. They want it to grow more. They spray cotton to slow it down because it's growing too fast. They spray cotton for bugs because the bugs will eat the leaves and the buds. They spray cotton a lot of times to keep the deer from eating it, okay? They spray cotton in order to make it bud. They spray cotton in order to make it not bud. And you go, my goodness, they control everything about the cotton. All except the rain. See, without the rain, they don't spray the chemicals because there's no need. If it's a drought, there's no need to speed it up or slow it down. It's doing all it can do. It's under stress. There's no purpose. And therefore, the cotton is not going to produce. I talked to a cotton farmer last week. I said, hide your cotton crop. He says, it's probably going to be the one of the worst we've ever had. I said, I'm so sorry. And he said, well, that's why you buy insurance. Okay? They buy crop insurance in order to help them to get through times just like these. But, but he's got a crop of cotton, 700 acres worth. 700 acres of cotton, and it's not going to produce well at all. And so, how do we look like that crop of cotton? See, many of our churches are just like that crop of cotton. See, we're in a drought. See, a lot of our churches are in a drought. We're, we're in a place of negative growth. We're in a place of starvation. We're in a place of where we need to be watered or we are being watered and we're just not accepting the water. And therefore, we are not able to produce the amount of fruit that God has for our lives. And the reason for that is we're in a drought. We're spiritually in a place of starvation in our own lives. See, everything about cotton depends on the rain. Everything on our life in a spiritual way depends on our ability to receive the water. 31%, this is a new poll, 31% of Americans consider themselves practicing Christians. Okay, A practicing Christian is someone that believes that God is God. He believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And they go to church at least once a month. 31%. 7% of Americans consider themselves or are listed as evangelical Christians. You know what that means? That means that they do believe that God is God. They do believe that Jesus is God's son. That he dies and rose again. That he lived a sinless life. And you go, well, that sounds like me, okay? They attend church on a regular basis. That's 7%. Of that 7%, 64% of that 7 are kids between the ages of 19 and 29 that are dropping out of church and not returning. So of the 7%, this poll came out this year, of the 7% that consider themselves evangelical Christians, 64% of their kids are not coming back once they get the ability to choose. So what's wrong with that picture? When you stop and you think about a nation that, so to speak, is a nation under God, I'll carry that term kind of loosely at this point, a nation that we say that 7% of the people that live in this nation are evangelical, which is very similar to you, 64% of your children aren't coming back to church. Why? What is the reason? What is going on? What is, what is keeping our young people from coming? What is keeping our young people from staying involved and being steady within the church? What, what's going on? Well, a large majority of that is because mom and dad were lukewarm. Because mom and dad didn't have a true, genuine relationship with Jesus. Because mom and dad went to church because their mom and dad took them to church. And so it was right for them to go to church on Sunday. And so they went to church. And they showed up. And yes, they went to Sunday school. And maybe they showed up at church on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. But, but the thing that's happening is, of those people, the majority of them are lukewarm. They really aren't sold out followers of Jesus Christ. And it's showing up in their kids more now than ever. Because see, the church today... Standing in the pillar in which it is founded, which is on the foundation of Jesus Christ, is separated from culture now more than ever. Because when many of you grew up, there was a moral standard. 
Even though you knew people that didn't go to church, they had morals. They believed in right and wrong. They knew that even though they were not followers of Christ, many of them didn't work on Sundays because Sunday was a day of rest, right? And so they would talk in a certain way around women and different way around men, wouldn't they? Yes. Men knew how to watch their mouths. And even though they weren't followers of Christ, they still had morals. Well, now more than ever, the church is separated. Now more than ever, you have churches and denominations that are logging on to the, the culturisms in America that is separating themselves from the Bible. And so if you separate yourself from culture, kids are seeing, young people are seeing that, hey, they're different. Wow, they're really radical people. I have no reason to be a part of that. Why? Because that ain't the God that they ever knew. They never understood Jesus for who Jesus is. We talked about that this morning in the youth class. We were beginning to understand who Christ is, okay? And until we get a good understanding about who Jesus is, about where the power that comes from, in order not to be lukewarm Christians, it's never going to change. It's going to continue to get worse. This year, there's less Southern Baptist, okay, Members in a church that has been since 1978. Do you know in the past year there was only 245,000 baptisms in the entire, entire Southern Baptist Convention? Why? Why? I'm glad you asked why. Because there's a reason why, okay? There's a reason to everything. And the reason for that is, is the church is in a drought. The church is in a place and it's dry. And, and just like we saw in Scripture, it's not dry. It is what? Very dry. We're in a place where we've gotten comfortable. We're in a place to where we think we're okay because we've got Jesus. Right? We're in a place to where we don't think we need anymore. So what is the cause of this dryness? The first thing is that we have a lack of desire. People that are sitting in the church pews on a given Sunday have a lack of desire to be any more than what they already are. So what are you saying by that? Well, I got Jesus, so I'm good. Talk to a man. It's been a couple years ago. You know why he was good? Because he had fire insurance. Exactly what he said. I ain't going to hell, I'm good. Never done anything for the kingdom. Lives a life like what he wants to live, okay? I'm not throwing stones at the guy, I'm just telling you what he said. That he's living a life based on a lack of desire to be any more than what he is. Let me tell you something. God loves you too much to leave you where you're at. He wants you to be more than you currently are. You just got to have a better desire, okay? So one of the reasons that you're dry, that the church is dry, is that you have a lack of desire to be any more than what you already are. You have a lack of desire to do anything different than what you already are. See, we got that mentality of, well, I go to church a couple times a month. Or I go to church on Christmas and Easter. Or I go to church and fill in the blank. Or I serve in the nursery. Or I do this, that, and the other. Well, so what? So what? What is your desire? Do you have a desire to be more than what you already are? The second cause of dryness is a lack of obedience. God has called you to do more, be more, and be a part of more than what you are. That doesn't mean he wants you to necessarily write a check. That doesn't mean he wants you to serve in every capacity. But God has called you to be obedient. He's called you to follow him. Remember Luke 9, 23, right? Deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow me. If you're not doing that, you're living in, in disobedience to what he commanded. So if you have a lack of obedience in your life, there's going to be dryness. And the longer you're dry, guess what happens? You get very dry. You get to the place that you're dusty. They've been hauling dirt out of my place this week, taking it to Mr. Harry's uh, uh, down to where his uh, place is there on the river. and We've had trucks running out there all week long, as dry as it is. And right there at the edge where they're loading, the dirt is so dry, it's like flour. You can do that and it just goes, and it's just as fine as it can be. You walk through it and it just rolls up on top of your shoes. It's so dry. See, that's the way some of you are here today. You're just dry. You don't have a lack of desire and you're, you have a lack of obedience in your life. And, 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 and the third reason for that, the cause of dryness is, is you have a lack of spiritual growth. You don't know how to feed yourself. You're literally starving. <clears throat> excuse me. 
You're literally starving to death spiritually. You're not doing anything to grow. You say, well, I show up and I listen to you preach, but what are you doing with it? Well, I show up and go to Sunday school, well, what are you doing with it? If this is all you're getting every week, you're dying. No wonder you're dry. No wonder you're brittle. No wonder you don't have any moisture left. See, you can't live and be a follower of Jesus without being fed. You've got to feed yourself. You've heard me give the explanation before, uh, the understanding, the illustration. I'll get to it in a minute. The illustration before that if you only ate lunch today, how hungry would you be next Sunday? You'd be hangry, wouldn't you? Absolutely. You'd be ready to jump on me to get me done so you could go eat. So think about that spiritually. If you're not feeding yourself, that's why you're dry. You're starving to death spiritually. There, there's no growth in your life. The fourth cause to being dry is you have the lack of ability to prioritize your life. You have the lack of ability to prioritize your life. What does that mean? Your priorities are all, all the whack. There's so many more things in your life that's important. Other than living all out and all in for Jesus. And so you get dry. Why? Because work comes first. Why? Because sports come first. Why? Because hobbies come first. Why? Because fill in the blank comes first. When Jesus isn't first, you get dry. Why? Because all that other stuff is just sucking the life out of you. Think about this. Take a 55-gallon drum. Okay? You got it? Everybody knows what 55-gallon drum is? Say, I do. Oh, you're all married. Just kidding. All right, so you got a 55, I got your attention, though. Got a 55-gallon drum, okay? All right? Now, take everything in your life that is coming out of it, okay? You with me? Your job, pull a line out of it, okay? Pull out it. Your hobbies, your family, your TV, keep going. Sports, friends, see all the lines coming out? What's going in the top? If you ain't got nothing going in the top, how long is it going to take that drum to run dry? Just like that. There ain't nothing left. Then what's happening? They're sucking the life out of you. Why? Because your priorities are all out of whack. You don't have your priorities in line. You don't have everything set up correctly, so you got more going out than you got coming in. And when you got more going out than you got coming in, what happens? Your checks bounce, don't they? Yep. That's a realistic picture. You can't spend more than you got because there ain't none there. But we do it in our own lives. We especially do it in our spiritual lives. We give out more than we're putting in. So therefore we're running on empty. And when you run on empty, what happens? You get dry. You don't get just dry. You get very dry. You get very, very dry. And so you see, there's more than that, but that's four ways. You have a lack of desire, you have a lack of obedience, you have a lack of spiritual growth, and you have the lack of ability to prioritize your own life because you've got too many things being first in your life instead of Jesus. And so with all of those things combined, some of you are walking in all of those. Some of you have no desire, you have no obedience, you have no priorities in your life, right? And you don't have the ability to have any spiritual growth. You're not feeding yourself at all, and you're just wondering, why does my life look like it looks? I can tell you it's pretty simple. You're dry. You're not feeding yourself. You're starving to death. You got more going out than you got coming in. And so how do we fix this? See, that's not only in your individual lives, because guess what? When that's your life, that becomes the life of the church. You with me? Yes. You know why? Because you make up the church. You are the church. Paul says that you are a member of the body of Christ. This is just a building. We can take this building down and flatten it all out and line chairs up out here in the yard. And guess what? We can still meet. And we can still have the Holy Spirit show up. And we still have people get saved. And we can still disciple people. This building at the church. God don't live here. Okay? He lives there. He lives within you, in your life. And so how do we cure this? How do, how do we fix what is dying? How do we cure the spiritual dryness in our own lives so that the church itself is not spiritually dry? See, we can't minister to the people's needs that we need to minister to if we're all dry as a bone. If we don't have anything to give out. 
you got to have something left in the tank. So this is your reason, right? i got three cures for curing spiritual dryness. If you're still in Ezekiel 37, say, I am. All right, look at Ezekiel 37 and look at verse number 4, okay? Verse number 4, this is still Ezekiel, okay? And he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. And I will put sinews, or muscles and tendons, okay? I will put sinews on you and make flesh grow back on you and cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and that you will know that I am the Lord. So what's the first cure to spiritual dryness? Number one, you need to hear the word of God. You need to hear the word of the Lord. Have you heard somebody, are you saying, have you, are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? You know what listening means? That you're taking what's given, given you, you and you're doing something with it, okay? You're listening, you're paying attention, you're hearing what is being said, okay? He said what? Prophesy over these bones. Why? Because God wants to cure your dryness. Remember what I said earlier? He loves you too much to leave you the way that you are. He wants you to be moist. He wants you to have skin on your body. He wants your bones to connect like he made them to be. And you're saying, is this an anatomy class? No, it's not. But it makes a perfectly good picture. It makes a perfectly good picture. See, many of you aren't just dry. You're very, very dry. You're just like the bones in the valley of the desert. Do you know that a desert, even the wettest deserts in the world, gets less than 10 inches of rain a year? That's the wettest ones. 10 inches. Okay? Think about that. Now imagine bones laying in the valley of a desert. Now think about how dry they would get. Sun every day, all day. No rain. No moisture. Just sun. Something sucking the life, the moisture out of the bones. See, you're like, many of you are like the bones in the valley of the desert. Your life is detached just like those bones. Get the picture in your mind. See, there's, this is the picture of an army that has been killed, okay? So imagine hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men, thousands of men. They all were killed, they all died, and they're down to nothing but bones, okay? So you're standing in the valley. You with me? Picture? Picture? Okay? Bones everywhere. As far as you can see, all around you, all you see is bones, okay? And they're not all laying there perfectly laid out just like they were. They've been scattered and moved. And so many of you, your life is just like those bones. You're detached. And there's no meaning left in your life. You're struggling because there's nothing left to hold you together. You've poured everything out and you've become so dry. It's just bones that's left. There's nothing left but bones. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Look, God wants to put your life back together again. He wants to take everything in your life, all the dryness of your body, and he wants to put it back together again. See, he wants to take your bones and he wants to put tendons and muscles back over them. And he wants to put them back in their proper places. And then he wants to form skin over your body. And he wants to breathe life back into you. See, God's got a plan. See, God desires for you not to stay where you are. God desires for you not to remain in the state in which you are right now. He wants to make you whole. You say, wow, it's been a long time since I've been whole. It's been a long time since I've had any reason in my life. It's, it's been a long time. Or some of you may say, I've never had that. I've never been whole. I've never been complete. I've never felt like I was doing what I was meant to do. Let me tell you something. God loves you. Listen. 
God loves you. Jesus loves you. Song said when we was a kid, right? Jesus loves me, what? This I know. See, the song says, for the Bible tells me so. But let me tell you something different. Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? Because I've experienced it. I've experienced the love of Christ. I know that he loves me. I know that he loves you. You know why? Because scripture tells me he does. And some of you have experienced that love. Some of you have walked in that love and you know what it feels like. You know that you have been loved. The first cure to spiritual dryness is that you got to hear that. You got to know that in your life. The second cure. The first one is hearing the word of the God. The second one is you got to respond in obedience to the word of the Lord. Verse 7 and 8. Look at scripture, Ezekiel 37. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And I prophesied, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, and there was no breath in them. See, God's plan for you to be made whole can only happen if you allow it. Think about what just happened. God told Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones that these things would happen. Now, Ezekiel could have said, there ain't no way that's going to happen. Couldn't he? Sure. Ezekiel could have said, there's no way that's going to happen. Why do I need to do this? That's, that's ludicrous. Who's going to prophesy to a whole bed full of bones? But what does he do? Out of obedience, he does exactly what God said for him to do. He prophesied, and as he prophesied, what happens? The bones begin to rattle. Hello? The bones begin to rattle. There's some bones rattling in you right now. The bones begin to rattle and they begin to come back together. And sinews, your muscles, your tendons that hold your body together begin to reform. And as they reform, the flesh begin to cover your body. Hello? God is wanting to put you back together again. And out of obedience, out of you allowing him to do that, he will make you whole once again. He will put you back together in the way that he desires for you to do that. But what's got to happen? You've got to respond. You've got to allow it to happen. You've got to be obedient to the word of God. See, if you hear it, but you don't do it, nothing happens. Some of you have heard 20, 30,000 sermons in your life. But guess what? You've got to do it. You've got to allow it to change your life. Just sitting here on Sunday mornings and listening to me preach. Just coming on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights. That ain't going to change your life. You can hear the greatest things in the world. But if you don't do anything with it, it doesn't change anything. Now let me ask you this question. If somebody gave you a million dollars tomorrow. And they said you need to invest this. What would you do with it? You would find a good trustworthy investor, right? And you would give the money to him, right? And you would say, invest this for me, right? Why do you look at me crazy? What else are you going to do with it? Spend it? Sure. But if you were going to do the wise thing, you would invest your money. You would put your money in a place that you knew someone was going to care for. Guess what? You need to take the advice, just like you would of the man that is, is investing your money. He would say, I think you need to invest in this bond, and you need to invest in this, and you need to invest in this, but you need to take some money and you put it over here too. Okay? He'd diversify your money. You would listen to him. Why? Because he's an expert. Because you know Bubba Joe down the road invested some money with him. And he's made Bubba Joe some money. So we're going to use him too. Why? Because he's an expert. Well, when you sit here and you hear the word of God being preached. And you hear the word of God being taught in your Sunday school classes. And when you come on Sunday nights and you hear the word of God being taught. And you come on Wednesday nights and we get on our face before God. And we cry out to him and ask him to do things. When you do all of those things, if you don't allow him to change your life. That's why you still look the way that you look. See, you've got to take the word that's given to you for what it is. Just like you would take the advice from an advisor and do what he said, you've got to take the advice from God and allow him to do what he said. God says, I want to change your life. You know what you say? Yes, please. No but waits. We're good at that, aren't we? 
Oh, but wait, I forgot I got to go do this. Oh, wait, but I, I really don't want to give up this. See, you've got to be obedient. See, when the Holy Spirit pierces your heart, you've got to move. You've got to allow Him to change your life. 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. What does that tell you? That God's desire for you is to be whole in Him. He came and He sent Jesus for you. He desires that you come to a fullness of the knowledge of His truth. See, when Ezekiel responded in obedience, God did what he said he was going to do, didn't he? Absolutely did. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. God says, I want to save your life. You know what you say? Yes, please. You know what he's going to do? He's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. But see, only you stand in the way. Well, God, why? Don't why. Say, yes, please. So-and-so, I want to change your life. Yes, please. So-and-so, I want to take away the addictions. Yes, please. So-and-so, I want to fix your marriage. Yes, please. So-and-so, I want to heal your family. Yes, please. So-and-so, I want to redirect you in your life to be a better follower of me. Yes, please. Not, nah, I don't think that's a good idea. See, Ezekiel could have done that. He could have said, God, I don't see that being, what, what is this going to accomplish? What is all this going to accomplish? I'm going to prophesy to a bunch of dry bones. There ain't no life left in none of this. But he said what? Yes, please. Yes, please. I want to see this. I want to be a part of this. I want to be resurrected like this. And when you respond in obedience, this happens to you too. When you move, when God says move, this will happen. God will put you back together again. But don't forget exactly what happened last. Look at the very last verse there in verse number 8. And it said what? And I looked and behold the sinews were on them, right? The, the, the tendons and the muscles and all of that. And the flesh grew and the skin covered them. But look, what's the last sentence? But there was what? No breath in them. Okay, so you can be obedient. You can hear the word of God. You can be obedient and answering the word of God. But guess what? That doesn't give you life. What? That's what it says. Was that the only place in the Bible that says that? Nope. Nope, it's not. Which brings us to our third point. The third way to, in order to be cured of spiritual dryness is you've got to hear the word of God. You've got to respond in obedience to the word of the Lord. The third thing is you've got to receive life by the Holy Spirit you got to receive the life in which he's trying to give you. Look at verses 9 and 10 there in Ezekiel 37. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophecy. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they will come to life. So what do he do? Obedient once again. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they what? Came to life, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Amen? Amen? That's what God can do in your life. You can hear the word of God being preached, you can respond in obedience, and you can allow the Holy Spirit to make you alive again. Because see, that's what happens oftentimes. See, we only get the first two parts. People say, well, I heard the word of God and I responded. I come to the front. I got on my face. I said, God, I want you to change me. I forgive me. And you get up and you leave and you go back and you go, nothing really changed. It's because you forgot the power. You forgot the batteries to this whole thing. You got to have the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel pointed out in the scriptures. He put them all back together again, but they were still dead. They didn't have any life left in them. See, God has put some of you all back together and you're just a corpse. You're just there, and you're missing life. You're missing the power. You're missing what you need to be driven, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. We've all been there in our lives. We've all been to a place in our lives where we've heard the word, and we were obedient, but there was no power. It's because you left out the power. It's because you left out the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit in order to breathe life. It's funny how that works alongside the last one, doesn't it? The last series on the power of living a life spirit-filled, right? 
It's the same thing. It's over and over and over in Scripture. We need to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. See, some of you have come. And you've got on your face before God. And you said, oh God, I'm so sorry. Oh God, I need you to forgive me. And you get up and you go back. And you do the same thing over and over again. You've come and you've asked for forgiveness. And you go back and you do it over again. You've come to church and you say, well, I'm just going to go to church. I'm glad you came to church. Okay? But church ain't going to save you. Church ain't going to give you life. Church is not going to fix your marriage. And you're like, well, dadgum, he ain't selling church real well. You know why? Because it ain't the church. It's Jesus. Okay? It's Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that gives you life. That fixes your marriages. That restores your mind. That brings you to a place of full service and for the kingdom. It's not the church. Now this is a great place to do it. Hello. Because we're supposed to be here serving Him. That is the purpose. This time right here we have it. It's for you to bring your lost friends. We forgot that. This is where you bring your lost friends. The classrooms is where we disciple you how you go get your lost friends. Okay? All right? That's what it is. And so that's us doing our job. That's us trying to help you be a better follower of Christ. But all of that, without you allowing the Holy Spirit to control your life, ain't going to change you. Because there's been people that have lived this life. They've shown up to church three times a week and sometimes four. They've been to every Sunday school. They've been a part of every prayer meeting. They've been in every Sunday night service. And guess what? They still ain't followers of Jesus. Well, dadgum, I thought church could fix me. Church can't fix you. Jesus can fix you. The Holy Spirit can bring life into your mortal body. See, the Holy Spirit is the difference. He is the moisture that will fill your body, that will make you alive, that will keep you from being dead. So the question is today, are you tired? Are you tired of being dry? Are you tired of being parched? Are you tired of feeling like you're pulled in a thousand different directions? Are you tired of not having life? And if you are, I can tell you the answer. Just like that cotton field over in front of my house. If it had got the proper rain, it wouldn't be this tall. It'd be that tall. And it wouldn't have just a few buds on it. It would be loaded. You say, well, can't I be this tall and have buds? No. God... God's desire is for you to be this tall. Okay? God's desire is for you to get rain. God's desire is for you to be moist. God's desire is for you to operate the way he created you to operate. And so you need to hear and heed the word of God. You need to respond in obedience to that word. And then you need to allow the Holy Spirit to empower you. See, there's a different life waiting for you. God has a plan for you. All you got to do is say, I'm in. I'm in. I'm tired. I'm done. And he will take you and bring you into the greatest place you could ever imagine. A place of fullness and joy and peace you can never get anywhere else. The question is, do you want it? Stand to your feet. Every head bowed and every eye